Hey everybody, we are at uh, We Have Waste Fest and uh, next to me is Francis Pullman. He is also the author of T-34 Shock, the Soviet legend in pictures. And since, of course, me as an aviation historian, I know absolutely nothing about these things, these tanks, I thought this is the perfect opportunity to do a little bit of a, an idiot's guide on this, air, uh, not on, on this aircraft, on this tank. Um, and yeah, Francis, uh, why don't you just quickly introduce yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Francis Pullum. Um, I'm 27 from Brighton. Uh, I got into military history at a very young age. Uh, actually, aircraft to start with. Ah, oh, fantastic. Dad used to sit me down yeah. with a book of aeroplanes yeah. and go, we'd go through everything. Yeah. Uh, but when I was 12 years old, I went to Bovington Tank Museum mm -hmm. and uh, that opened up my passion for tanks. Um, after I'd left college, I was working a minimum wage, minimum wage job and I thought, uh, this isn't really what I want to do with my mm -hmm. life. So I just started writing. Um, fantastic. Uh, and I've now got two books under my belt, T-34 Shock being the yeah. most recent one. And I'm, yeah, very proud of it. But uh, I, I also do living history and reenactment. Yeah. Um, it, it gives me a great opportunity to play with these great toys. Fantastic. We'll put a link to the, the book in the description as well. Um, I'm going to have a couple of very naive questions about this tank. Obviously, a Soviet tank. Um, however, you said, I believe, that there's actually an amalgamation of a Soviet turret and a Czech hull. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, this one? So, yeah. Um, Whenever I approach a T-34, I always, uh, you always sort of go through the identification process. Yeah. You look at it and go, where did this thing come from? And when I first saw this tank, it was a little bit of a mystery. It, mm -hmm. it, it, um, it confused me where its origins were, but upon further investigation and looking deeper into where the chassis numbers are stamped and, and uh, the technical features that date it, yeah. I'm quite happy to say that it's a very early Czechoslovakian hull with a Soviet World War II turret, specifically yeah. 1944. Fantastic. Now, Let's have a little bit of a walk around as uh, some vehicle passes here. Um, first of all, escape hatches. I believe tanks had escape hatches on the bottom. Yeah, so T-34 yeah. has a single escape hatch in the floor. Just one. Uh, just yeah. the one, yeah. that's for the engineer. So there's okay. actually four escape hatches on T-34. The most obvious one obviously being uh, for the driver, the driver's yeah. hatch. It's not a very pleasant thing to get out of this or get into. How did you do? Do you go like sort of arms first or do you no, go legs first? Uh, if you're going in, it's legs first yeah. with body skywards. Once yeah. you get your hips inside the hatch, turn around, yeah. tuck your legs inside. and oh, You've got to be out. nimble for that. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> and then getting out, uh, especially if your tank is burning, it's yeah. just however is easy for you. Okay. Uh, you've got two hatches obviously in the turret. Yeah. Uh, the loader's got a hatch just for him. The command cupola, the commander and the gunner will escape from. Yeah. But the poor engineer down here in the hull has got perhaps the worst escape hatch yeah. on the T-34. Like you say, he's got a floor hatch, uh, which it opens up forwards. So there is a little bit of protection from the front. Oh, that's good, yeah. If you look at the ground clearance, there isn't all that much space. Yeah. And you think that if the tank was burning, you'd have to crawl towards the, uh, towards the enemy. Uh, not a very good position. It was actually the engineer's position that had the highest mortality rate in the war. Okay. They just couldn't get out in time when tanks brewed up. Wow. Uh, the famous track tensioning that we always see on the Chieftain's channel, how is that done on, on, this, on this tank? So T-34 has carried a single track tensioning tool by the yeah. end of the war, and it was all done on the front here. So on the glasses plate here, we've got an access po uh, port which is plugged, yeah. and this eyelet which you insert the base of the tool in once you've taken the plug out. It's essentially a, attaches to a uh, fritted screw at mm -hmm. the front of the tank. And if you look right underneath here, you can see there are interlocking teeth. Uh, right, yeah, the yeah. The idler wheel. And the idea is, is uh, you push out the idler, you then turn the tool, yep. which uh, turns the fretted screw, and then it, it, it raises or lowers the idler wheel, and then you can just push it back into place, which tra uh, tensions the track. Fantastic. And I just see this thing here and it confuses me. What exactly is this? All this is is a duck board. So okay. this is put on for uh, wading rivers. Yeah. Uh, you try to get less water into the driver's hatch. Oh, that makes this sense. is actually oh. a very late war feature. This was okay. only introduced in 1945. Mm -hmm. So before that, if you were fording a river, everything would go <laughs> into the driver's hatch. Right, okay, fantastic. Um, for the cannon, now this is uh, 85 mil? Yeah, so yeah. this tank is issued with a, a ZIS S53 85mm gun. Yeah. It's the standard Soviet uh, gun that was put in T-3485, okay. not the only 85mm gun. Um, very effective gun. It could penetrate the frontal armor of a Tiger, for example, at 1,000 yeah. meters. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Um, 
One of the things that I sometimes notice with tanks, because I know nothing about them, some tanks have muzzle brakes and this one doesn't. Is there a reason for this? Muzzle brakes tend to help with the uh, recoil of the yeah. gun. The uh, 53 here is actually based off a Soviet anti-aircraft gun, the uh, K-51. Right, yeah. And that did have a muzzle brake, yeah. but in the tank you didn't need one because of the, uh, the, the, the gun is mounted in a heavy enough turret. The velocity of the shell is not so high that it's going to damage yeah. it. Okay, fantastic. Before we go around, I see you wearing flags. What are those for? I mean, there's a little bit of myths uh, surrounding um, radio sets in these tanks as well. Sure, okay. yeah. So there's a misconception that no Soviet tank had radios in World mm -hmm. War II, and that's simply not the case. Um, before the war, it was one in five tanks had a radio, and it would yeah. be the uh, section commander, platoon commander, divisional commander would all have the radios. Yeah. The rest of the communication was done through semaphore, mm -hmm. so waving flags around. Yeah. Uh, come Barbarossa, June 1941, it's still roughly one in five. So T-34s were issued with radios before the war. Yeah. If you were really unlucky and had a very early tank, um, the turret was in the radio and there's a very cramped turret. Yeah. But most 76s had them in the hull. Okay. Um, during the war, you get to May, June, July 1942 and there's almost no radios in T-30s at all. Mm. They're producing them so fast and the quality has dipped so much right. and they strip most of the electronics. Okay. Still has an electric turret traverse and internal lights, but everything else is gone. Mm -hmm. By the time of the Battle of Kursk, and especially July and August 1943, however, uh, it had been ordered that every tank should have a radio. Yeah. So by T-3485, every tank has a radio. However, crews are still issued with uh, signal flags for mm -hmm. semaphore. Uh, it's uh, Germans obviously always listening into Soviet radio communication, yeah, yeah. so elements of um, communication is done through this. But even more simpler things like traffic control. Mm -hmm. um, you, as a Soviet tanker or infantryman, you could be put on traffic duties and you'd need to direct traffic as it drove through places. Yeah. Even simple things as parking the tank, someone in front of the tank waving hand signals. Yeah. If the light's not good or um, they, they just want to use flags, they yeah. can use their signal flags to help a tank park. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so let's have a walk around um, and, and see what we find. But first of all, not a naive question. I always see Soviet tanks with logs. Where's the log? And why are the logs used? Like, what are they used for? Soviet logs are used for unditching. Okay. So uh, if the tank is bogged down in boggy soil mm -hmm. or thick snow, you could take a log off and put it underneath the tracks. It yeah. gives it a little bit more purchase so mm -hmm. the tank can then roll off the poor soil on yep. the ground. Uh, this tank doesn't have a log because they didn't have time to cut down a tree today. Okay. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Fresh out of logs. Uh, let's have a look about, I guess those are auxiliary fuel tanks? Yep, yeah. so T3485 has uh, three external fuel tanks. These are 50 litre drums, Yeah. Uh, but they're not the only type of external fuel tanks that T34 had during its career. Yeah. In November 1940, the first T-34s uh, had long square fuel tanks on yep. the side of the hull. After Operation Barbarossa, the fuel load increases. Uh, certain factories, especially Stalingrad Tractor Factory, SDZ, yep. they put up to 20 fuel tanks on the externals of their, their tanks to give them the range. Wow. However, the nature of the war changes and in, in the middle of 1942, all the fuel tanks are taken off the tanks. So mm -hmm. They're just, just bare tanks. Okay. However. Again, the situation of the war begins to change, and in October of 1942, there is an order given to add external fuel tanks back onto the design, mm -hmm. and three factories get to work designing external fuel tanks. Uh, UTZ-183 and OMSC 174 have big boxes on the back of their tanks, yeah. whereas Cheney Oblinsk, uh, factory number 100, CHKZ, mm -hmm. use drums. Which That's this had, one, yeah. Yes, which they yeah. had been using on KV-1s before that. Yeah. Uh, this was by far the most successful pattern and by the middle of 1943 every factory was using these drums instead of the boxes. And how do you get the fuel that's in here into the fuel tank? Uh, so the it would be hand pumped in. So okay. underneath this grill yeah. you've got the access ports for, you've got uh, two fuel tanks right. and an oil tank yeah. and it's the same either side. Um, depending on the factory that made it they're not always symmetrical. Mm -hmm. Uh, you just take the cap off one of these and then feed a hose through and a pump. From over here, I guess? Yep, yep, take the cap off and feed fuel back into the fuel tank. Yep. So it wouldn't feed directly from these, this is just spare fuel. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Now there's one thing that I saw earlier that reminded me a little bit of late war German jets, especially the, the Heinko 162. I have a video on that one as well. And it's in, in the back you have these tabs that hold, 
I mean, what is this called? First of all, is like the 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 grill. The, yeah, the yeah. Um, the grill cover yeah. for the louvres is, is is what I. Call and it's just held in place with these, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just Soviet engineering at its absolute finest. You don't yeah. need a fancy lock to hold down the cover. It's just a simple pin you pull out. Yeah. The early T-34s, however, they held theirs down by a leather buckle, okay. um, which was actually taken off the design in 1942, all a part of the simplification process. Okay, fantastic. And uh, these tubes here that seem to go towards the, the engine, but don't really, they're not connected right now, are they? No. Uh, what do they, those do? So um, T-34, like many other tanks, have yeah. the ability to generate smoke. Mm -hmm. And the way that it was done on T-3485, was two 25 litre uh, drums were placed either side of the exhaust shroud. So one would be here, yeah. one would be here. Okay. And they would connect through here into the um, um, exhausts. Yeah. So when it was activated, it would mix with the exhaust fumes and smoke would generate through the exhaust yeah. pipes. Just like they're doing nowadays. Exactly like they do in modern yeah. times. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. To do transmission maintenance, I guess you open this hatch and if you want to do a little more substantial stuff, you've got to open Absolutely. all the, the back. Yeah. So yeah, this is your transmission hatch yeah. on early T-34s. It's square with four bolts. Okay. Uh, in 42, uh, Krasnoy Samovo 112, one of the T-34 yeah. producing factories, introduces a slightly smaller round hatch. Yeah. And then in mid 42, this pattern of hatch becomes standard across nearly every single. So it, they actually three. complicated this. It was four bolts initially, and now it's round and, and nicely it's, shaped. It, it's ease of use. Okay. So not everything in Soviet tank development is about let's make it simple. Yeah. Sometimes it's about what's practical. Right. And a smaller hatch wasn't practical. But yes, yeah, so you, you undo these seven bolts, yeah. pull this down, you've got access to the transmission. But like you say, if you need to do more extensive yeah. work, you can undo all these exterior bolts. There's a frame welded to the hole and you've got these nice hinges that yeah. keep it in place and you can just pull the rear hole off and it okay. gives you access to all the engine. So I noticed, I mean, they, they've put quite a lot of work into this hatch, but you still have these cutoffs here that are incredibly crude. And I think once we open up the grill in the back as well, we see, we see it with the radiator flaps. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the key things with Soviet things is um, the gas axing never tend, never is never good. Yeah. And a part of how I identified this hull as Czechoslovakian is actually the quality of the finish. Mm -hmm. I'm fairly sure these louvres are definitely Soviet. And what's interesting about them is uh, the louvres, uh, sorry, exhaust shrouds. Their exhaust shrouds were introduced in 1942 yeah. at one particular factory, U, uh, UZTM, uh, which indicates that these were probably taken either from an early, a 1942 T-34 or more likely an SU-85. Yeah. Uh, UZTM went on to manufacture all the Soviet assault guns. Yeah. Now, one of the advantages, I guess, if, if, if a tank is knocked out, another tank can potentially tow it to safety, which is something that obviously aircraft can't do because, you know, physics, what <laughs> goes up must come down. Um, but it, I assume you would just hook up another uh, tank there, you would put it into uh, neutral gear and then you just go that's off that, with... That's yeah. essentially the principle, yeah. Um, tow hooks um, are cast by middle of 1941 but before that they were a welded pit, uh, tow hook with a pin yeah um, every t-34 carries two tow ropes mm -hmm. and uh, the, yeah a recovery vehicle or another t-34 would simply hook on either the front or the back and put the tank in neutral if that's possible and it could be towed off okay it's quite a simple process wow shall we try to get on uh, I will need to know how exactly that is done. I'll show you uh, exactly how it's done. So it's actually a surprisingly easy process. Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to put your foot on the track, Yep. grab onto the grab handle, and then you can just leave yourself up. So it's as easy as that. Oh yeah, I mean, it's obvious when you have practice. <laughs> this is very different to getting into an, a cockpit. You haven't tried getting inside yet. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. That's the next step. Okay, so I'm up. I haven't fallen down just yet. Yep. Fantastic. Okay, so there's the uh, the radiator grill. Um, yep. Two man job to kind of open it. Shall we? Shall we give it a try? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this one isn't attached correctly at the back. But yeah. You can still open it to gain access to the transition compartment of the engine deck. Yeah. So if you want to grab onto the handle that side. Yep. We're just going to lift it up. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there we yeah, go. Yeah, that was a little bit heavier than I expected. Oh. Push it forward a little bit. Yeah. So there, there we go. And oh yeah, the gas axing there. Yeah, yeah the, the, the cut on that is not good at all, is it? Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> rough and ready, but it doesn't need to be. And uh, the bits that need to be precise are precise at the engine. Yeah. 
transmission is all reasonably well tooled. Yeah. But things that don't need to have the finesse of critical items, yeah. they don't need to be. So they're not dumb. This reminds me a little bit of, of course, of cooling in, in aircraft where you can shut and open the uh, the radiator flap. I assume that's these yeah. swivel points here and... There's, a, there's a control yeah. rod down this uh, left-hand side. Oh, is it that one? Yep, right. and when we get inside the tank, you'll yeah. actually see that it's not by the driver, it's by the commander. Okay. And uh, so the, com the, the order would be given up, the chain of command as it were, to open or close the radiator to allow less and more air in. Okay. Now, to close this, I guess it's... The reverse process. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky because we need, get, we need to feed it back into its hole. There we go. Okay. We're latched in. There we go. So obviously, um, this has been restored. Yeah. Factory fresh T34s, it would actually be physically hinged in place. So yeah. we wouldn't have to worry about playing around too much of all that. How much is this sort of a vulnerability in, in terms of, you know, close combat with infantry? It is reasonably vulnerable. The uh, Germans were trained in how to attack Soviet tanks and one of the main areas they were told to go for was the grill. Yeah. So uh, German soldiers were trained to come up with an axe, make a hole mm -hmm. in the mesh here yeah. and then throw a grenade or a petrol bomb or whatever they had yeah. into the engine deck. Also bundle grenades or bundle mines, mm -hmm. anything was placed onto this grill and engine deck because it is a slightly more vulnerable part of the tank. Yeah, of course. I mean, once it, there's a mobility kill, that's essentially it. Yeah, if, you, if, you're, in, if you're a tanker and your tank uh, stops moving under your control, yeah. you're going to want to get out of there pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, that reminds me a little bit also of, I can finally bring something air combat in, into this video, um, with, with essentially what the Luftwaffe says and also the Allied Air Forces. If you, know, if we, if you stop a tank, the crew knock, uh, jumps out and then they're vulnerable and then you can just knock them out, right? Yeah, with, with, exactly. with bombs, exactly. rockets and machine guns. And Soviet anti-tank gun crews were trained in doing the same thing. Okay. So there's a bit of a misconception that the 37mm Pac-36 couldn't take on a T-34. Mm -hmm. And while it couldn't penetrate the frontal or side armour, yeah. what it could do was damage the track to make the tank immobile. Mm -hmm. German anti-tank gun crews also learned very quickly that if you aim between the drive wheel track and the fender, mm -hmm. there was a weak point that damaged the transmission. Okay. So you weren't necessarily penetrating the armor or physically knocking out the vehicle, mm -hmm. but you were immobilizing it. Yeah. And that was enough normally to get the green Soviet crews in 41 to bail out. Okay. Talk about bailing out and, and crews. How do you get in? <laughs> It's a, it's a pretty simple process. Actually, before that, what are these two egg-shaped ovals thingies? That is, um, these are armored covers for the air intake fans. Okay. Uh, it's, inside a tank, it's important to keep a positive pressure atmosphere. So yeah. that when you fire the gun, yeah. all the nastiness, all the residue, smoke and powder, yeah. all goes down the barrel instead of being sucked of back course, inside the yeah. tank. Okay, so that makes sense. When in combat, they're switched on, yeah. but they also need some protection. So, getting in. We're going to go in through the loader's hatch. Sure. It's just a little bit easier than getting in yeah. through the cupola. There's less things to uh, catch on. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to sit on the rim, dangle your legs inside, yeah. and you want to put your right leg on the turret ring, okay. and your left leg will just Drop fall down. down to the ground until you touch the floor. Oh, that reminds me a little bit of the uh, Sea Vixen. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Right, I'll have a close watch of how you're doing it. Yeah, no problem. So, like you say, sit on the rim. Yeah. Right foot behind the turret ring. Okay. And then it should just be a case of... Letting gravity do the work. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, if I never see you guys again, this is where I died. You're conscripted into the Red Army. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right leg on the turret ring. All the way down. That's Gravity it. does the work. Oh. oh, there is more space than an aircraft, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I sit on this seat, does yeah, that work? Absolutely, yeah. that's the um, commander's seat. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. So, how very Air Force of me to immediately assume command. <laughs> oh wow, these these uh, vision ports are minimal. Yes. Um, so the cupola is introduced onto the T thirty four in June nineteen forty three. Uh, none of them are available at Kursk because they reached the front in late July. Yeah. Uh, so imagine trying to be in a T-34 without a cupola. Mm -hmm. So the commander doesn't have any means of looking at the tank other than the periscopes that he's got in front yeah. of him. And that's the, uh, the one here that's in the 
in the cupola, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. an MK4 periscope. It's yeah. actually, des des uh, the design is based off British periscopes that were sent over on the British tanks. The Soviets really liked the simplicity of the British ones and copied them. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And uh, I guess the gunner sits in front of me. It does indeed. Yeah. And internal communications. Uh, there's an internal radio hooked up? Yes, yeah, so there yeah. is internal intercoms. Um, not everyone, though, has the ability to speak. Okay. Uh, so the commander... How very Soviet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the commander, gunner, and driver are all linked with throat mics and earphones. Yeah. The loader and engineer, however, uh, would have only had earphones. Uh, okay. You can tell the difference by what kind of plug they got. So okay. I've got a two plug uh, headset. You've got a post war one, but it's a four plug, so you've got m uh, mic communication uh, and earphones. Okay. So I can talk. Yes, you can talk. Oh, I okay. can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the gun, of course, uh, the muscle, no, not the, the protection shard here. Um. Yeah, so this is actually in the travel position. Okay. So we can put it into the combat position if you like. There Do is I have to? There is a D ring just here. Yep. So yep. if you'd like to pull that out. And then let go, and it should just click into place. Watch yeah. your leg. There you go. Oh, okay, and uh, that's that's the whole recoil right here. Yes. Um, there would normally also be a spring ramp here to help feed shells. That's not on this one. It's yeah. still under restoration. It should be pointed out. This tank's about ninety percent complete. Okay. So I notice with the gunner here, how exactly do I sit? I mean, you're all welcome to sit in the seat. Yeah. Uh, both legs go forward of the seat. Ooh. Maybe we can move this yeah, back up. Yeah. Yeah. Can I hold on yeah, to these? Yeah, yeah, you can hold on to those. They do, they're, the, they're the armored covers for the Oh, they actually slits. open up? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, yeah. so... Okay, so, and that's... Uh, well, it's blocked now. But that's how you'd aim the gun and... Is it's the elevation? At the moment, everything, yeah. st everything moves. So you've got a big white handle to your left. That's yeah. the turret traverse. So if you want, you can give that a quick whirl and see what that's like. Is it safe to uh, burn out? Are you holding on? Uh, yeah, I'm sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I assume up goes towards the right? Uh, if you, yeah, up is, up is, no, I think up is left. Up is left. Oh, up is right. Oh, there you go. Okay, that's... So it's three revolutions a degree. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll also notice that it's actually geared up to an electric motor. Because oh, yes. yes, there is a misconception that Soviet tanks didn't have electric turret traverses, and that's absolutely incorrect. Every yeah. model of T-34 had an electric turret traverse. Okay. And uh, later on, when we switched the electronics on, I'll let you have a whirl with that. Fantastic. Um, you'll notice the difference in the speed. Yeah. The trigger, is that on the elevation? Exactly, that is. Uh, there's also a secondary trigger if things go wrong attached to the side of the gun. It's okay. just a simple pull lanyard. Fantastic, okay. Uh, elevation, I'm not going to play around with that for now. Um, You've also got the gun sight in front of you, yeah. that's a TSH-16. Mm -hmm. It's a four-time optical zoom uh, uh, scope. Yeah. Um, and it's again, another one of those things, that every Soviet tank had a gun sight. Um, there, yeah. There's another misconception that um, tanks were issued without gun sights. Um, this comes from post-combat evaluation of abandoned and knocked out Soviet vehicles, yeah. where the very first thing they were trying to take out is the optics. Okay, fantastic. Um, sort of defending this this tank, obviously, tank on tank combat, we've, we've all seen it, against aircraft. Uh, was there anything, something like a machine gun hooked up on, on top to shoot at aircraft, or were they just told to, to run into a forest? So early Soviet tanks, we're talking in the 1930s, yeah. had a dedicated anti-aircraft ring. Okay. Uh, it was called the P-40 AA mount. Mm -hmm. It had a simple DT-29 machine gun. Mm -hmm. The DT-29 is the Dictorov tank, model 1929. Yeah. T-34's got two of them. Okay. What's interesting is in 1939, when the uh, prototyping of the A32, the predecessor to T34, is complete, and they give out the list of requirements for the new T34. They ask for an anti-aircraft mount, but that's yeah. never ever installed. If an aircraft came to attack this vehicle, there was several things the crew could do. One of them, absolutely run away. Yeah. If they felt brave, they could take out the machine gun coaxial to the gun or yeah. in the hull. Bipods were carried with the tank, and they could use the bipod and the tank to aim the machine gun manually at right. the aircraft. A uh, somewhat convoluted and courageous process, yeah. Yeah, okay. it was only in things like the IS-2 and I, uh, that had a dedicated DSHK machine gun mm. for anti-aircraft work that yeah. it was all brought back in. 
Okay, fantastic. Francis, thank you so much for this quick tour and ask my naive questions. You're very welcome. Uh, and yeah, everybody check out Francis's book, of course. And uh, I'm going to try to get out somehow uh, without buying my head again. <laughs> but uh, it, it, is, it is actually a lot of space in here compared to some of the aircraft I've sat in. So uh, um, it's, it's interesting to compare it to uh, British and American tanks. So yeah. you notice this tank doesn't have a turret basket. So mm -hmm. when the turret rotates, me as the in the loader's position would have to move with the turret. Oh my, yes. Um, okay. when, it, when it comes to loading the main gun, yeah. I've got uh, ready racks in the bustle, yeah. the rear part of the turret with 21 rounds. I'm leaning against racks for four more rounds, yeah. and then there'll be pairs of rounds dotted around in spare spaces. Yeah. Uh, but and you know, I'll be crawling all throughout the tank trying to get these rounds ready to use. Yeah. But once we've used up our, our ammunition, our floor, our combat floor, is actually more ammunition bins. So wow. it's kind of important to move around inside this tank. Yeah. Um, the irony being that it's a very cramped vehicle in the lower fighting compartment due yeah. to the way the tank's designed. Okay. Fantastic. Well, there you have it, folks. That's uh, the Idiot's Guide to the T-44. And uh, yeah, have, uh, have a good one and see you in the sky. Uh, how do I get out? <laughs> <laughs> Which way do you want to go? Do you want to go through the cupola or through this hatch? Uh, what's the easiest? Just be careful. Uh, what I'll do is I'll hold that down. Yeah. This one moves. So if you can, try to put either, don't put your fingers in against the trap it or push your weight against it. Okay. So what you want to do is you actually want to climb onto the armor seat yeah. behind you and then you can work your way up. You see why we wear overalls inside tanks now? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I do have a flight suit, but uh, <laughs> it's not the same. Oh, and I guess that would be the foot rests for the commander then? In theory, yes, but yes. I actually find it more comfortable to sit sideways on, so yeah. my legs go lengthways. Yeah. No. no, how does this work? Uh. Yep, you want to put your foot on that seat. On that seat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe go on here first. So I'll not touch the sides here, uh, the you, periscope. You can, you can touch the gun sights, but don't pull on this or that. Yeah. Oh. 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 So the tank is on fire and you've got nine seconds to get out before the ammunition comes off. Yeah, I'd rather have a parachute. Although I guess if if there is a fire, it I would be out there much quicker. Oh, I survived. Oh yeah, we can see your practice. <laughs> yeah, I've done it a few times. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that was cool.